uh, let's talk about cancer because Rhonda, while I think both of us are, and and I think there are others who share this point of view, completely convinced. Uh, and I, in fact, I, I just don't see how how one could not be at this point convinced of the benefit that exercise poses to the brain. It seems much harder to make the case for cancer. In fact, when you think about some of the things that are such obvious problems with respect to dementia, for example, disrupted sleep, poor exercise, et cetera, clear relationship, very hard, at least for me, to make the case that bad sleep is related to cancer, although I think it is, right? But I, I don't, the data aren't clear, right? Like you can certainly make the case that horrible sleep would lead to a weakened immune system, a weakened immune system, especially the cellular system more than the humoral system would easily lead to an increase in not necessarily cancer initiation, but cancer propagation. But again, the data are, are so much less obvious. Let, let's talk about this relationship between exercise and cancer, right? On the surface, it should make sense. Exercise is good. Cancer is bad. More exercise should mean less cancer. How compelling are the data? And I'll admit that I haven't gone as deep here as I have on cardiovascular disease and neurodegenerative disease. So I, it's also another area that I'm very, very interested in um, because, I mean, as you start to get into your fourth decade of life, you like, you've, you've now had a friend or a family member that has come down with cancer and you see just, I mean, I mean, you're a physician. So of course you've, you've experienced it on, you know, at, at a different level, but like, you just see how terrible it is you know, to get cancer and um, in like, and that it really the best, best hope is obviously to try to not get it, to prevent. And there are, as you mentioned, there are things that, I mean, there, there are definitely things that uh, can modulate that risk that are a little, you know, genetic, you know, wise that are harder to kind of uh, move the needle. But um, overall, so with respect to cancer incidents, it's interesting if you look at like, you, you were talking about some of these elite at, elite athletes, right? I mean, like people winning the Tour de France and uh, people that are Olympic medalists or maybe that have even just entered the Olympics. I mean, you have to be quite an athlete yeah. to just get into the Olympics, right? And there's been a lot of interesting studies, quite a, quite a few um, that I have seen. And, you know, uh, this is these are studies where, um, you know, observational data again, um, so obviously, obviously caveated with that looking at people um, that have just entered the Olympics and, you know, over the course of like from 1912 to 2010 or something like that, like, you know, just decades um, and looked at all cause mortality, cancer related mortality and compared it to like the general population. So there's a couple of studies that have come out of the U.S. Um, and if you look at, you know, both of those studies, one of them was actually looking at medalists and the other one was just looking at people that like were in entered the Olympics. Um, they they saved about one and a half to two years. Like in, in other words, they were of life um, from not getting cancer and um, about five to six of just basically they, they, they had a five to six year, um, what you could call lifespan extension mm -hmm. compared to the general population. Same with like French, uh, French Olympians as well. Some very similar where it was like, you know, five years, they lived on average five years longer than people, you know, than the general population. And they were they It was attributed that they had basically saved, you know, two years of life from not getting and dying from cancer. Um, I guess I should say dying from cancer because they are, they are two different things. But that would yeah. be like at the elite level. And it's interesting because you go, well, two years, like that's it? I mean, that's kind of, I that's how I see it. I'm like, really? Like two years? Um, and it's funny because I remember when I was a postdoc, my, my postdoctoral mentor, Bruce Ames, um, he had said to me once, or actually more than once, um, you know, I once read, you know, there's, and of all the things that you can do, like if you prevent cancer, you really only save about two years of <laughs> your life. And I always thought, I'm like, no way, no way. Um, but anyways, um, so so that would be like at the extreme extreme end when you're looking at the the you know the actual athletes, um, they are they're definitely less likely to die from cancer than than general population people. But when you look when you're talking about prevention, so there's a difference between you know, if you read a study and it says, you know, people that are physically active are X percent less likely to, to you know, die from cancer. Like, can so cancer mortality is decreased. That's not necessarily the same thing as not getting cancer, right? That just means you're not 
dying from cancer. Uh, so the studies looking at cancer prevention really seem to focus on a specific type of exercise, and that is aerobic exercise. For whatever reason, there's not a lot of literature on strength training and cancer prevention. You, you can find uh, studies on you know, strength training and cancer-related mortality. But with prevention, I really, um, it's, it's, it's sort of focused on, for whatever reason, on aerobic exercise. And it does seem like there are certain types of cancer that are more responsive to exercise with respect to, um, you know, basically having a reduced risk. And some of those cancers are ones that, that are, we should care about. So breast cancer, you know, what's the lifetime risk of breast cancer? For a woman, it's about one in eight. It's pretty, pretty high uh, for the average woman, right? Um, of course, many different lifestyle factors play into that. And exercise, you know, is, is one of those factors. Colon cancer is another one that seems to be quite responsive. Um, lifetime risk of colon cancer for average woman is like one in 23. For a man, it's like one in 25 or something like that. The reason I'm mentioning, as, as you know, Peter, lifetime risk of cancer. Like if you're talking about like esophageal cancer, some cancer where it's like one in 500, I mean, you're more likely to die in a car wreck than get esophageal. Like, you know, one of those cancers, I think it was esophageal cancer, but you get my point where the lifetime risk is is already kind of, you know, quite low uh, for, for the general person or the average person. Um, so, so breast cancer, colon cancer, and then uh, there's a few other cancer types that are, are quite responsive, but those two in particular kind of stand up because with prevention um, and also with like with respect to people that are diagnosed with cancer and have those cancers and then they engage in physical activity as well, um, it's very like you see a very robust response with respect to like reducing cancer mortality and also recurrence being, you know, being, you know, it's like 50%. Like, so you see like, can, you know, cancer mortality is reduced by 50%. Cancer recurrence is reduced by 50% in those individuals diagnosed with breast or colon cancer or colorectal cancer that are engaging in more physical activity. So the question is, well, how much? And you mentioned like you have a lot more knowledge with respect to cardiovascular disease. And I would argue the data really, I would say, suggests that you actually probably need to do more exercise. Um, to sort of reap the cancer preventative benefits than you do cardiovascular benefits or you know even mm. you know some of the metabolic benefits um and i don't know why that is but um it seems as though you know like like getting more to that upper limit of what these you know committees are recommending so 300 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise um or maybe 150 minutes more of like what they would define as vigorous which actually i think is a little bit their vigorous is a little bit um, below what my definition would be, but um, anyway. So, so it seems like the 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 amount of exercise you actually have to put in a little bit more time and effort for for the cancer. But any any amount is beneficial. So it's not like you know, oh well, I can't do three hundred minutes, therefore I'm, I shouldn't even care. Well, that's not true because there is there are benefits, you know, even with like any type of physical activity. Uh, so, you know. That's all the observational data. And you can find anywhere between a 10 to 20% reduction in uh, basically people are that, you know, they're less likely to get, can you know, breast or colorectal cancer, 10 to 20%. Again, when you're talking about a type of cancer with a with a higher lifetime risk, um, it, it makes more, it's it's more compelling, right? Um, so it's always no, I, I'd be, be I'd be curious to see if the data line up with the cancers that are known to increase in risk due to obesity. So right after smoking, obesity is obviously the second leading uh, modifiable risk factor associated with cancer. I've always thought that was an oversimplification because we use obesity as a proxy, but I think it's probably insulin resistance that's the true marker that obesity is serving as a poor man's version of. Um, it would be interesting to see, because there are certain cancers, including breast and colorectal, by the way, where obesity amplifies risk. There are other cancers where obesity doesn't seem to play as much of a role. Um, it would be very interesting to align the exercise data with the obesity slash insulin resistance data and see if exercise is disproportionately reducing risk in those cancers for which obesity is a risk. Such a good point, Peter. And um, I think there is 
at least some data to suggest that you are uh, correct with that. So, um, I mean, what is there like 13 or so cancer types that like obesity is? Known yeah, to it's either 13 or 17, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and 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 breast and uh, colorectal cancer are on that list. And so, um, yes. So it, the aerobic exercise um, it, you know, there's, I think there's direct mechanisms. So like, you know, aerobic exercise is, you know, directly you're making those myokines and like, you know, some of these myokines have been shown to, to basically, um, decrease the production of like growth factors secreted from cancer cells. And they're like, they also like kill, you know, are killing cancer cells, um, uh, you know, through a variety of other mechanisms, also the anti-inflammatory effect, you know, from from exercise as well. So you're you're having a, a strong anti-inflammatory response, but also like there is the little bit of that. Okay, well, exercise is also like improving insulin sensitivity, mm -hmm. and it's you know you're in combination, particularly in combination with dietary strategies, weight loss. You know, you're, you're the weight loss itself is is basically a important component of the cancer uh, reduced cancer risk so i think you're totally i think it's a combination of these things mm. where it's like the the direct effects from from exercise and there's also you know it's really interesting because as i mentioned um people that even have cancer um the 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 response like it, it seems like you know, physical activity, like I am not an oncologist and you know many more oncologists than I do. I don't know that I've, you know, I don't know how common it is for for, for oncologists to prescribe exercise as an adjunct um, sort of treatment to, you know, whatever the person, you know, whatever type of treatment, whether it's immunotherapy or radiation or chemotherapy or a combination, whatever. Um, I, I don't know how common it is, but um, the, the data is more and more compelling. And I think it's become more and more compelling over the years that really uh, exercising is, it seems to be very important for reducing cancer metastasis and also dramatically, in, you know, decreasing cancer recurrence. And so a really interesting mechanism by which this is likely occurring is literally through that sheer force mechanism I was describing mm. for the brain. Well, as you know, you know, cancer cells, tumor cells sort of escape the site of the tumor and they make their way into circulation. It's called a circulating tumor cell or a circulating cancer cell, depending on the study you read. And, you know, these circulating tumor cells are like traveling throughout the vascular system to dis distant sites and they sort of take camp and then like it's like kind of the seed of, you know, a new tumor forming in another tissue. Um, well, it's really interesting because um, these cancer cells, cancer cells are so messed up, as you know, like they're just, they're like, they're, they're completely wonky and very, very uh, sensitive to stress, any type of stress. They have these mechanico, mechano receptors on their cell surface that are responsive to force, sheer force. So when you get your blood pumping, it's like, it's like a hurricane that like just wipes it out. Um, they die because they can't they can't they can't stand just the sheer mm. force of the blood flow through, you know, the vascular system. And so um, and this is where you'll see, you know, studies you can sort of pair it. So you can pair the mechanistic studies. And there have been there have been some studies looking at circulating cancer cells. And it's like people with those are like three times more likely to have cancer metastasis and um, and so on. But um there, there, there. Again, there are studies showing that like physical activity like dramatically decreases, and this there's been randomized trials showing it dramatically decreases circulating cancer cells in people um, compared to whatever their the other you know standard treatment that they're you know pe being given, um, and so like kind of pairing that data with looking at you know other data where uh, exercises is being prescribed to to patients and it is beneficial with respect to their cancer metastasis reduction and also mortality reduction, you know, like 50% mortality reduction, you know, versus recurrence as well. So I do think there is substantial evidence to suggest that being physically active is a good measure um, for cancer prevention. And, uh, you know, I don't, again, there's also a lot of differences. There are sex differences as well. Like, I don't know why, but in some cases, women respond better um, 
you know, and there's certain cancer types that respond better. Lots of variables here. Like I'm, I feel like I'm speaking in a general way, but like, but like there are lots of things to consider, right? There are cancer types and, and there are sex effects and there are, as you mentioned, other covariates. There's obesity and there's, you know, insulin resistance and um, age as well. So, I mean, there are lots of it's nuanced as, as, as usual, but I do think that you can make the case that like, if you, like, what can I do, y- you know, in my life to reduce, you know, reduce my my risk of getting cancer, reduce my risk of dying from cancer, reduce my risk of getting Alzheimer's disease, reduce my risk from getting dementia, um, reduce my risk from getting cardiovascular disease, reduce my risk for <laughs> type 2 diabetes. Like the only panacea there is is exercise. It's exercise, right? Uh-huh.